that's a very uh, straightforward address, really just speaking about how uh, she and the entire department intends to be very deliberate about how we write stories that give us a sense of who we are. And uh, now we're going to go into the panel. Oh, let me pull this mic off. It's misbehaving at this point. I'm going to uh, now lead us into a panel discussion where we're going to hear from um, emerging authors, from a publisher as well, about the power of literature to embed national consciousness. This is going to be an incredibly important discussion, judging by the profiles of the speakers that are going to join us on stage. What I'll do is I'll call them up, and once they're on stage, I'll give you a quick run, uh, run through their profiles. Not, not just scare you, but just to give you a little bit of a, a sense of the kind of depth that we're going to get today. So let's please give a round of applause as they come on stage to Dr. Chiliti Rashidanga, <laughs> Mr. Linda Kumbi, <laughs> Malaika Wa Azanya, <laughs> Tadiso Masate, <laughs> Dr. Morris Masuta, Sorry, just clearing up for them. We also have P. Pacific Cabilera joining us virtually. He should be on our screens uh, any moment now. Dr. Rajitanga is going to facilitate this discussion for us this evening. I'm going to try my best to be very picky about what I mention. The, the profile is pretty exhaustive. But Dr. Ashitanga is a Mitchell Fellow, he's a PhD graduate of the School of Public Policy and Administration at the University of Delaware in the United States. He holds uh, degrees from the Nelson Mandela University, as well as the University of Johannesburg, respectively. He's also the chairman and founder of the New Cities, New Economies Institute, the Global Consortium for Africa's Economic Development, and the Global Black People's Convention. He serves on a number of boards and is a chairman of both Bukabuso Barona Investment Trust as well as the Kaburona Investment Holdings. He is a director for the Bapugubu Institute for Strategic Relations, deputy chair of the Gauteng Growth and Development Agency as well as the chair of the Innovation Hub. Let's give him a round of applause. Please. <laughs> we also have Mr. Linda Duli. If you can just raise your hand so everyone can see you, who's an electrical engineer, tan a turned management consultant, motivational speaker, author, life coach. He spent over 12 years at Transnet, and companies like ESCOM, where he was an electrical engineer before starting Rise Up and Do It Business Enterprise, which is accredited by the services CETA. He's got a great passion to work with people from all walks of life. And some of his achievements on TV and radio include uh, having a remarkable um, uh, contribution to various radio shows as well as regular appearances on uh, various TV stations. Mr. Linda Ndu. And then we have Malaika Wazaniel. If you could raise your hands, everyone can see you, who was voted as one of 50 powerful women in South Africa as well as top 200 young South Africans. She's a Soweto-born and bred individual who is a Pan-African social activist. Should I try and speak up? Yes, I want to try and speak up and everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Right, so the back. Okay, it seems to be working perfectly fine. Always switch it off and start again. She's got a deep passion for Africa. She's traveled to over 40 countries on her development work. She's an award-winning essayist. She's also an author of books that have reached crit critical acclaim, including Memoirs of a Born Free, Reflections on the Rainbow Nation, which was published in South Africa and the US as well as in Europe has been translated into German and is a prescribed reading in universities both locally and internationally. She gives lectures at various local and international universities 
and of course she holds uh, degrees. Um, she's got a Bachelor of Social Science, an honors degree in Geography, cum laude. She's got a master's degree in, in Public Affairs, and she recently completed a master's degree in Urban and Regional Planning, cum laude. So, so you get the picture here. <laughs> but let's give a round of applause for my life. Joining us virtually, as I said, and uh, hopefully on our screens at this point, is P. Pacific Cavalera. Um, P. Pacific was uh, born in Rwanda and experienced uh, horrors and adversity, but has overcome them despite all odds and has gone on to achieve feats such as being one of the top 100 brightest young minds, granted the Mandela Road Scholarship, as well as nominated and shortlisted for the uh, Archibald Dudu uh, Leadership Fellowship in 2017. He's also met uh, President Madiba twice in his life, and uh, he continues to, to teach through his talks as well as through his books, so P. Pacific. Let's give him a round of applause. As well as Tali Somasaba, who is a, uh, a a very special person who started as an intern at Chicana Media, and in just five years, she she changed the DNA of the South African publishing industry when she became a publisher herself uh, through a company called Blackbird Books, and um, that's really become the pride and hope for a new generation of black writers. She she's a publisher of. of uh, a number of acclaimed books, including um, the, the bestseller Endings and Beginnings by Reni Klavi, My mm -hmm. Father, My Master by Megan Tosh Polela, and Malaika uh, as well, uh, with her memoir of uh, Memoirs of a Born Free, just to name a few. So these are the, the individuals we have in our panel today, and I'm going to hand over to Dr. Hachitanga to facilitate a discussion, after which we'll get some engagement from you as members of the audience, so I want you to think about some of the things that are said on the panel that you think are important to engage, because we are going to take those questions at the end. But for now, uh, Dr. Hachikanda, over to you. So the conversation of national consciousness is really in the uh, concept of a national question. This idea of how we grapple with um, the antagonistic contradictions that uh, still endeavor our society. And the legacy of um, the divide of racism, the divide of gender practices, the, um, the divide of class uh, essentially still lives with us. So in a way, we are dealing with the issue of liberation, um, but of the most affected, the ones that were most affected by uh, this divide, which is really uh, the, the, the most oppressed who are African in particular. So if we have to think about national consciousness as defining a common shared identity, insofar as the economy is concerned, the question arises, do we have a common economy? Do we have an idea of an economy that we can say that uh, it, 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 it welcomes all of us? We know that we don't because there is still a huge rural and urban divide in our economy. In our economy, there is still a huge racial divide in the economy, and in, there is, in fact, a huge uh, gender divide in the economy. So in essence, we are really here talking about the decolonization of our economy, focusing on the indigenous knowledge of products and services and goods that emanate from the indigenous people's practices. The questions uh, that will uh, arise, which I would request that the panel members in their esteemed experiences and observations, um, try to paint a conversation around is whether in the written work that uh, exists and that is evolving, there is enough attention that we are putting on uh, lifting um, the indigenous economy as it were, because uh, one can argue that that is our competitive advantage if we want to be liberated as a people and we want to form part of the mainstream of the economy, we might as well just look at the advantage and, 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 and things that are most closest to us, but which have not been fully innovated, products and goods and services that haven't been fully innovated and modernized, that are not packaged uh, to the extent that they can really uh, and contribute uh, hugely in our economy and bring the vast majority of our people into the economy. They are 
already uh, in existence, these goods, products, and services. If you look at indigenous art, if you look at uh, indigenous food and cuisine, if you look at indigenous textile, clothing, and fashion, indigenous culture, heritage, and tradition and practices, for all of those things to remain alive, they are products, goods, and services that are necessary, uh, but they need definitely to, to, be, to be catapulted into the modern times without um, taking away their authenticity. Um, and you look at indigenous health products, uh, you look at uh, indigenous tourism, indigenous design and uh, decoration, something that can be likened to an African feng shui of some sort. Um, but what we are saying here is that as authors, as publishers, as people who are involved in the ideation space, are we giving enough attention to these matters so that we can indeed uh, document them, uh, so that we can indeed put a spotlight on them and ensure that they don't recede back in the, in the back uh, foot of the, the, the economy of our country as we are defining it. Um, so I would like us to um, probe these matters and I know that the panel that we have today is a, 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 a fit panel for this conversation. Um, there are people who are involved in provocations and lamentations um, because they are published, they, they, they have been uh, grappling with different ideas. So I'll start with you, my dear sister, um, Malaika Wazania. Just a broad opening remarks of um, uh, what you, you think in terms of what exists in written form or not always in written form actually because you know, what is the library of our indigenous knowledge systems? It's not all in the books. Some of it actually resides in the minds of our people, uh, our indigenous knowledge uh, I went to visit, um, I went on a study tour of Tanzania with a group of young scholars and we visited the towns of Morogoro and Dar es Salaam and so on. And we had the opportunity to speak to a number of, of locals in the area, many of them who had been um, you know, hosts of our liberation struggle heroes when they went to Tanzania in the 1960s, 70s, and the earlier parts of the 1980s. And one of the conversations that we had with them in our reflections on you know, where South Africa is, where the African continent is, and the many um, protests that are emerging in this post-colonial dispensation. What has been, you know, how has Tanzania been able to sustain its own identity? How has Tanzania been able to sustain its ways of thinking and of doing things, right? And held on to some of the practices and ideas that had been embedded in that society pre-colonialism. And one of the gentlemen who was there with us there um, in Morogoro said something very profound. He said to, to us, you know, here, one of the things we find very peculiar about you as South Africans is that when you go to protest, you destroy everything in your wake. That there's nothing wrong with protest, but you destroy everything in your wake. And it's something you never see us do here in Morogoro. No matter how angry we may be with the way that things have been done in our country. And one of the colleagues that I was with asked him, that, you know, how is it, how do you guys manage to instill that level of consciousness in your people that even in a state of very you know, intense and passionate uprisings, they would still hold on to the infrastructure and protect that infrastructure. And the response was perhaps one of the most profound things that I had had in very many years of my life. The gentleman said to us, you know, when we protest, there is no possibility at all that we could bang down the school or bang down a library or bang down any public infrastructure. Because here in Morocco, a lot of what you see here was built by the hands of our own people. So as far as 50 years, 60 years ago, our government was not coming here to build anything for the people. At times, they would give us the raw material to do the construction. But every resident of this area where we are would dedicate a few hours of their time every week for as long as it took to build this infrastructure. And upon its conclusion, we understood that infrastructure to be ours, to belong to us. So with the labor and the sweat and everything that we put into building this, there is no possibility that we can allow anyone to destroy this in the process of protest or that we ourselves would participate in that destruction. And so perhaps the issue here 
is how far do South Africans feel that things belong to them? And why is it that, and perhaps part of why it is that it's so easy for you to destroy things, it's because you don't feel that they belong to you. There is a sense of belonging that is not there. And, and, and as he said that, I thought back to that monument of Robert Sobuko in Khalishio. And I thought that there was a profundity in the statement that this man was making. That at the heart of why it is so easy for the people of Khalishio to destroy this monument that celebrates such an extraordinary human being that is Robert Sobuko. It is so easy because they don't feel that such things belong to them. They don't feel that this South Africa that they live in and that they are part of is a South Africa into which their citizenship in the true sense of the word and their personhood in that country is respected and is humanized and is dignified. And I think this is the, the significance of these dialogues that have been um, instituted by the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture here in Gauteng province. Um, Chief Director Shane and HOD, um, I cannot emphasize the significance of these dialogues because at the heart of what these dialogues seek to do is to humanize African people. For me, the only reason I chose to participate in this dialogue because I turned down so many offers to speak anywhere is because, because I'm busy, I don't do it because I'm arrogant, I do it because I'm busy with my masters. Um, but I chose to come to this one because I thought there is something very deeply humanizing about a dialogue that seeks to speak to African people about indigenous knowledges, about indigenous economies, and about a history that we carry on our backs, which for so long has been rendered invisible. So I cannot emphasize the significance of this dialogue, and I'm so thankful that finally in South Africa, 28 years later, we may be 28 years late, but finally these conversations are beginning to be had by people in spaces where they occupy and by people who need to be having these conversations. And not as a once-off event, but as a series of dialogues building up to much greater progress. I'm very grateful for that. I needed to say that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I hope I'm audible. I'm generally very loud, and I'm indebted for the invitation uh, to the department. I think it's a, and I'm just facing forward, uh, Dr. Reichstand, but I'm responding to your question. Um, yes, in, in higher education, uh, when it comes to the condition of an African, uh, young people today would say, we are just there for vibes, uh, really. Um, an African does not feature in South African universities, or any university in the world for that matter, other than being repurposed as a consumer who must buy their way through university and be taught as an act of debt service training. That is, you are taught in order to earn and pay back the debt that you used to study. So you can't call that thing education under any circumstances, other than to be serving a particular type of economy. But I, I, when I looked at the flag, upon walking here, I wanted to laugh. And I'm glad the flag um, came up earlier. Because this is very relevant to what I have to say. I, I'm, I'm a proud uh, fan of James Baldwin. He's, he's really somebody I look up to. Um, and uh, I want to just take us a little bit back in history uh, and borrow from his 1965 debate at Cambridge. Uh, because we say we are here to raise consciousness. And we also say we want to deal with the issue of moral regeneration. But let's start with raising consciousness. I think we must raise our consciousness for very specific reasons. Bringing the flag, Baldwin, to paraphrasing, says, look, we must resist. We must raise our consciousness in order to resist conditions of coloniality. Because if we don't resist, we will one day wake up and realize that the flag to which we have pledged allegiance has not pledged its allegiance to us. And that the country, which is a place of our birth and the very source of our identity, has not, in its whole system of reality, carved any space for us. And so if you are talking about knowledge that is being produced and distributed in higher education, I must tell you it's a marketplace. So a marketplace is serving very specific acts of neoliberal repurposing of what constitutes education, 
Managers are really behaving and earning like CEOs. Deans are behaving like unit managers. Lecturers themselves have to bear in mind that when I'm teaching, I'll also be evaluated by those I'm teaching. The consequences of which will determine whether I'm promoted. So really, they are just behaving like other mid-level managers in a corporate machinery. Before you even get to the idea of, of the indigenous economy or indigenous knowledge, I want to remind us, like, I, I, I'm a fan of historic uh, analysis because history has a way of teaching. If we're talking about an indigenous economy, it must be financed, it must be funded. Thank you so much. Uh, greetings to our MEC, the HOD, uh, every leader who's here, and thanks to you, Doc, and thanks to the panelists that are here with me. It's a, it's, it's a serious issue. We, we, we have a... I think even though we, are, we have gotten our freedom 20, 28 years ago, Still, still things are not in our hands. Um, the very same universities that we are talking about, when you need to go for your, your thesis, for instance, someone has got to approve what you're going to write about. And that person does not come from your culture, does not understand what are your needs in your, in, in your, in your, in your uh, community where you come from. So we've got a serious issue. You, you find that that person would say, no, we, that, one, that one go. And, and they don't know that what you are doing is something that will uplift the economy of your township or the economy of our country. And, 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 and the reality is you'll have to fit in with what makes sense to that professor or that doctor. And if it doesn't, doesn't make sense to them, you've got to withdraw it. So as I go around speaking, you realize that people are in varsities, but they are just there to get papers. And, and you find that even worse, I go and speak to corporates. In the corporate world, most people, in fact, over 70% of people who are holding positions, they don't like the job they're doing. They just don't like it. They are there to get the money. So most people who are passionate about something are not operating in, in their calling or their area of passion. And that's the reality we have. I, I, I'll just take you back. When Mapoja Mall was opened uh, around 2010, the first shop that was closed in Mapoja Mall was exclusive books. And that's the reality. As, as emerging authors and, 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 and those of us who have been in this field for some time, you realize that people don't want to read. And here's the reality. They always say, if you want to hide something, put it in the book. And it's a reality that we are dealing with. But I think we've got to change the narrative and begin to tell people different things. And as I go around, I always say, if you want to get ahead in life, you must first use your head. You see, we, we can speak about, thank you so much, we, we can speak about wealth, we can speak about economy, but let's be honest, wealth does not start in the wallet, it does not start in the bank account. Wealth has got to start in the mind first, and if it's in the mind, then actions will activate it until it gets to the bank account. So our reality is that we need to conscientize our people to say, start thinking big. And we need to even conscientize our parents and say, don't condition your kids that they've got to go to university. Sometimes going to university, it's for just the experience of going there. For instance, you can tell a person who has not gone to university if they're running a business and the person who has gone to university. Even if you can be a, a dropout at the university, there are lessons that you pick up at the university that you won't pick up anywhere. So when we talk about the relationship building in a business, you need to be a person who is very much aligned to know what works, what does not work. To compensate, sometimes people use the word pan-African to mean the whole of Africa. And I, I want to challenge some actually authorities here in various contexts, when you mean African in whatever it is that you do, 
what do you actually mean? Um, now, I want to share with you something, and, and, and you were talking about what, what does one do that you can learn from. In, in terms of <clears throat> literature and, uh, and, and, and research and writing and sharing, I, I have to say that, unfortunately, uh, it's not great news in Rwanda either. I was uh, reading an article recently published that uh, talks about uh, between 1994 and 2019, this is 25 years, there were 398 articles focusing on Rwanda that appeared in 12 leading journals, and only 13 were authored or co-authored by Rwandan scholars, and this is 3.3 percent. 25 years was a genocide. Now, of course, most of them were not about all of them were not about the genocide, they were about Rwanda and then what is happening in Rwanda. The contribution of Rwandans were 3.3%. And now this is 25 years. I was reflecting on that and thinking, what would it be in South Africa actually? What would be the contribution of African uh, black South Africans, I have to emphasize because of your, your, your context uh, of this country, that is in the, in the literature and research and, and, and published in, 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 in various forms, what would be the contribution? Um, and this is so important because we are talking about consciousness. It's not that we don't study or we don't observe or we don't reflect or we don't write. But we have to publish, and when we publish, uh, our colleague just now talks about selling, we need to sell, or we, we need to get our voices and our writing consumed. Now, one of the things that Rwanda does really, really well, I have to say, is to shape a narrative about Rwanda. This is something that is at the center of what Rwanda does. Now, it may not be in literary forms or published works, but you can be sure that Rwanda's public relations uh, is, is at the center of what Rwanda does. And I, I, I'm going to tell you that Grand Rwanda, in so many circles, has overtaken Grand South Africa, uh, and especially outside of South Africa. And this is, this is so important because when we're talking about consciousness, we need to be able as a society to say, if I do this, what impact is it going to have? And now, unfortunately, I, I could mention this uh, talk about xenophobic attacks or, or criminal um, acts that uh, target foreign jobs, whatever you call it, whatever you are going to call it here in South Africa, in, on the rest of the continent, it, it is perceived differently. Now, I have just two quick stories I want to share with you. When I was in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I must apologize. It's way past my bedtime, and my English meter has completely run out. <laughs> and I'm very cold. Um, you know, I, I think I must first say I regret taking those uh, hormones. I want to return them. I want to return them urgently. Um, because, you know, one of the first things I'll mention is that this is probably one of the first government conversations that I have been to that talk about publishing, that are centered around publishing. Um, a few years ago, I was in a meeting, um, I came out and my phone had so many notifications and I didn't know what the hell was going on. It was in the era of a um, uh, good story to tell. Do you remember that in government? Uh, and apparently an MP had stood up and, and mentioned Blackbird Books as part of the good story to tell. And I, I mean, I waited, I thought, yes, this is it. It's happening. It never happened. Um, it's very difficult to publish in this country. Uh, one, I am the youngest, the smallest, um, the only black woman publishing in mainstream publishing in South Africa. It is incredibly hard. It is 
a racially charged um, situation. I am working and competing with people who um, who have, are trust babies, you know. I'm coming in here and my dad was just a cop, you know. A very good cop, but a cop and, you know, didn't make money to leave me money to start a business. And so it, it's incredibly hard and I'm saving several masters, I'm saving my authors, I'm saving the market, I'm saving the bottom line. And they don't always work together, those three things. In terms of narratives that are being, um, that are probably not seeing the, you know, the light of day. The HOD, when he spoke earlier, he spoke about how people needed to move away from the I agenda. You know, that people are wanting to just write memoirs. And it, it's not just they didn't want to write about memoirs. For me, what I find overwhelming in the submission box is that it's me and my tears, my wounds are healing. Those guys, men have all lied to us. We don't have to write books. There are, there are memoirs that are important and that must be, must be written. For example, when Malaika did her memoir at 21, people thought I was crazy to publish a 21 year old. The author thought I was crazy to publish a 21 year old. But her story was important because it offered us as South Africans a place to start to interrogate who we were and, you know, and who the people her age were against what democracy was and where we were. So there is, a, there is a place for the I narrative. There is a place for that agenda. But please, let's stop with the wounds and the tears. Every, every single woman has been lied to. It's not book worthy. Um, which is why I always say, I always meet people who say, um, you know, I have a book in me. And, and, and yes, all of us have a book in us. Some books must stay there. <laughs> Thank you, um, Madam Program Director. Thank you to the panel. Um, I know it's past, past bedtime now, but I don't take a lot of the time. I'd like to firstly pay tribute to the young lady who started her own publishing company. It is indeed very, very difficult to work in the book market in South Africa, especially when you're up with large multinational publishers. Ma'am, a national consciousness, not only in our, in our country, in Kauteng, but throughout our country, the very thread of that is our language. Once we lose that language, we lose our culture and we lose our identity. And writers in our country have to be given the opportunity by libraries and education to take work in their indigenous languages and take it to grassroots level. And grassroots level does not come through education departments in schools, but through libraries, where they get to the general public, uh, children, and our youth. I cannot write in any of our indigenous languages, but I've, I've written and published 43 books for children. And they are all translated into our different languages, some in 11 official languages. And these books are devoured by libraries. Libraries are waiting for these, for these books to come through. And we have fantastic writers in our country, like Cabello, Duncan, uh, Katia, uh, uh, Sabata, Mokai. We have these people writing these beautiful works, but they're not getting to grassroots level. I'll give you one example where Deteriorate, uh, deterioration of our language makes an entire community or an entire race of people suffer. From the end of the 1990s uh, to, for the beginning of the 1990s to about 2010, people in my community, where 66% of my community makes up the youth of our, uh, of our people, have lost the ability to speak either Urdu or Hindi or Telugu or Tamil. And what that actually has done, it's taken them onto a platform where they are questioning their own traditions, their own culture. They begin to, to, to question their God. And that has broken our societies into so many different pieces, yet it was a kaleidoscope of tapestry 
coming on tiny memorial. And I would like to make a plea to Gauteng Pro uh, Provincial Library Service to make money available to our librarians to buy books in our indigenous languages. Or I can't say it in Isisulu or Isifasa or Pedi, but I noticed something some time, some many years ago when my daughter was little and we used to use uh, uh, Afrikaans language when we used to watch Seven the Lamb. I don't know, uh, don't know Afrikaans very well, but I know that this character's dialogue was incorrect. She said something like, Eget kadunk, that hey, help me kalak. This is on national television, produced by one of our film companies. But I know in Afrikaans there's no such word as kalak. How long do you think that these little children, she's a writer by the way, the little 15 year old Malaysia, how long will our, our children start speaking Isikosa and Isizulu and Hedi and Swati and whatever other language they speak in our country? Thank you so Thank much. You, man. Thank you so much for that. So the, the same place that I asked, as you know, like when you, when you approach, I use the set of the house, and then uh, also I ask the required information as to how to write the edges to shelves. And um, I approach the edges. You know how? How much percent he charged? He said 65 percent in order for me to get my book into exclusive books. So imagine I put up money, like put so much effort into into fulfilling, into making it a reality. Now I need someone who has a potential, who has a platform, who offers a platform for us, like because we are animal. We are just out there, people looking at us saying, no. Um, the book does not have that much potential of saying, therefore we're going to charge you that much. And exclusive books at that time, they said that we're going to charge 50% for the shelf space. So 80% was for 80 minus for my book. Marketing was for me. So these are the challenges that um, we as, as young people who are in the industry are facing. And nobody has address them. The only time, and then it's a very, very, very sad and um, that others will sell us in KZN, at least that's the only platform I can able to go directly to say this is my way, can you please assist me? And they stop for all KZN libraries, and I'm very grateful for that. But now I'm sad that the very same uh, bookshop is closing down in KZN. Now who, who is going to assist? Because now they are big men. We are trying to, 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 to climb the ladder, but they are big men. And if they are not popular, it's very difficult. Like his image, like the issue of saying, uh, I, I do, sometimes in public speaking, I do get invitations, but I'm not out there. And this is only when I'm able to say maybe five books or ten books. But because I'm not new, there are a lot of invitations. Thank you. I would like to request that in your own networks, let these dialogues continue. Because you've got many platforms, you've got organizations, you've got communities where you come from. Let these dialogues uh, continue to happen. Insofar as the library is concerned, I want to repeat that, what is a library? So we can have a library that is physical in form and, 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 and stature, like the one we have here. But we also have uh, libraries in our communities. As I said, we've got uh, elders in our communities who are philosophers in their own right. Within them resides libraries of knowledge, wealth of knowledge and information that we have to find an innovative way of how to uh, harvest that knowledge and not, not let it die with them, simply because it's not organized in Western form. Thank you very much. Can I please ask, um Mr. Vianney Pop, to please uh, come and join us on stage with the sub members of his team. Just to thank our panelists this evening and to give them a token of our appreciation for the very much provocative uh, contributions that they've made that I hope have helped us to think about um, issues that really ring true to what the theme is. 
raising consciousness. Um, I'm not sure how we want to, to hand these gifts out, but I think maybe we can have our panelists just um, stand, as we call them, and maybe Mr. Rian, if you can join us on the set on the stage, as well as, uh, or are we gonna get them, do you guys wanna come up? So we can just send them on the stage. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask maybe Mr. Rian, if you can stand center stage, just so that they, they can get some good shots, and then we'll call our panelists one by one, to get a gift into, to grab a shot. So I'll start with Dr. Chile Tirachitanda. Let's give him a round of applause.